Imagine this. It is the year 1880. We are standing in a courtroom at the Old Bailey, the Central Criminal Court in London. The room is crowded, it's stuffy, it's badly lit. A young domestic servant is standing in the witness stand. Her name is Jane. Jane has never seen a courtroom before or any room that is this impressive. To her it must be overwhelming and it must be scary just to be here. She is giving testimony against the man who had raped her. She recounts the events in painstaking detail to a room full of men, including the defendant. At the end of her testimony, she repeats, I was afraid to scream as he threatened to kill me. I did not consent to what the prisoner did. Jane was 15 years old and the defendant was her father. That last line in Jane's testimony, I did not consent to what the prisoner did, it's uncomfortable. But in 1880, the age of consent was 13 and there was no specific offence of incest. I first encountered the story of Jane in the archives researching the history of sexual consent. We often think of sexual consent as a modern concept. It's not. We just don't know that much about its history or how people in the past understood it. And that is why I am exploring consent and criminal trials in the 19th and 20th century to know more about it. If I asked you to define sexual consent or explain to me what it means, what would you say? Defining it is hard, you'll probably find, and perhaps it's easier to recognize the absence of consent. We can recognize it when we see it as physical resistance or explicit cries of no or even in that discomfort of the silent submission. Lack of consent has been part of definition of rape for centuries. But you might be surprised to hear that criminal law only defines sexual consent in 2003. In 1880, when Jane was facing her father in that courtroom, there was no legal definition of sexual consent. So at every trial, a new meaning, a new interpretation was given to this concept. In the 19th century, much like today, victims and prosecutors had to prove lack of consent to convict a defendant. The judge's role was to guide the jury on that point of law. But they rarely stuck to their role. They rarely even said the word consent. Instead, judges looked for signs of resistance and violence and they often dismissed cases if there wasn't sufficient evidence of injuries. They openly scolded women for drinking or having sex outside marriage. They also called women untrustworthy, particularly if the women were poor. Judges simply ignored things like poverty and social constraints and even power relations between a parent and a child, like we saw in the case of Jane. Jane's father was convicted and he was sentenced to 20 years. It was an exceptionally long sentence at the time. But only a few months later, an appeal judge released him. The judge said he just couldn't be sure that Jane had not consented to sex with her own father. It is clear from such cases that judges simply did not believe the testimony of women and girls. In the archives, I have found many words of sympathy for the defendant, but only few for the victim. This is particularly important as legal history is the history of men, male judges in particular. It is their words and their actions that are recorded as law. Women and girls did speak about consent and of their experiences, but in a very different way to the judges. At times victims, like Jane, they clearly and explicitly said, I did not consent. Women also spoke of lack of willingness, not wanting it feeling scared or feeling overpowered. They rarely spoke of injuries or physical violence. For example, when a 12-year-old girl called Claire testified against a man who had groomed and abused her for months, she was clearly confused about what had happened to her. She kept saying to the court, I just didn't know what else to do and everything was done to fright. At the same time, the men in her village collected the petition to release the defendant. They said Claire looked mature for her age, and so clearly, according to them, she had abnormal sexual desires. 
For them, he was not to blame, she was. It is clear to me that sexual consent is not a modern concept, nor is it a straightforward one. It is also clear that we only know half the story. History is silent on stories such as those of Jane, Claire and countless other women and girls who once stood in a witness stand. In my work, I want to challenge these traditional ways of thinking about law and legal history. Instead of just focusing on judges' words, I want to look into the stories of ordinary women and girls who brought allegations of rape to a system so clearly stacked against them. I want to know how did these women speak about consent and resistance and deception. I think it's time we hear their stories and that this time we listen and believe them.